Kathy Wood, uh, Kathy Wood, new interview out here with Kathy Wood. It reveals some very interesting information around Tesla stock in this video and around uh, what's going on with Tesla demand and talking about a few things that uh, not a lot of folks are, are really looking at. And she also talks about uh, her other stocks in this video as well, as well as the overall macroeconomic landscape and some of those things. So I'm um, really excited to get into this one with you guys here today. Obviously, been an incredibly uh, tough last 12 to 18 months for Kathy Wood and ARK Invest. ARK is down uh, over 62% year to date, and uh, it had started falling before that. So it's been a really, really brutal, let's just call it last 12 to 18 months for ARK and for Kathy Wood. So I, re I respect that she didn't go into a cave and hide this entire year, and she's still out there um, giving her opinion and those sorts of things. Um, it just hasn't been her type of market. But um, do not uh, underestimate the return of Kathy Wood, okay? As soon as we get back into a bull market, um, and there's a debate if that comes in this at the end of this year or in 2023 or in 2024. Um, you know, Kathy Wood will thrive again, and many of her stocks, not all of them, but many of them will thrive again, and they will soar, and she will uh, once again be uh, kind of put on a pedestal. So do, do keep that in mind. She's just been uh, really kicked, really kicked a lot uh, down over the past 12 to 18 months. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy this as always. Let me know any of your opinion on anything discussed in today's video and any of my reaction here. Also, if you want to get my free stock picking checklist sent to your email, um, or we can text it over, whatever you want, um, check out, it might, I'll probably have it as like the pinned comment down there if you want to access all that. Alrighty, guys, let's get into this. And that, of course, is Kathy Wood, ARK, found, ARK Invest founder and CEO. Oh, by the way, thank you for everybody subscribed. We're already well over 16,000 subscribers now, which is crazy. We hit that over the weekend, so I appreciate each and every one of you that subscribed to the channel. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you, okay? You recently wrote an open letter to the Fed where you warned about deflation. We talked to Michael Darda of MKM at the top of the show where he said the Fed is making the mistake of looking at backward looking indicators. What should the Fed be looking at, Kathy, when it's trying to really assess what is happening with inflation? That's true. They looked at way too many backwards looking indicators last year. And now they're looking at way too many backwards looking indicators now. Uh, but that's the Fed, um, you know, and you, you can either have them try to predict the future or look at backwards looking data, right? And so both are not ideal because if they try to predict the future, they could easily be wrong, right? If they just look at backwards data, then they're really not caught up on what might be the reality of today, right? So uh, it's either one's not perfect. Sure. Hi, Julie and, and Brian. Uh, well, if you look at what's happening in the pipeline, uh, what you're seeing in terms of commodity prices are some very serious uh, declines, both from their peaks and year over year now. Sure. So that uh, is sort of we would say that's upstream inflation uh, that is heading towards the PPI and then ultimately the CPI. So. Uh, we've got uh, gold prices. And in fact, I looked at them yesterday. I had thought that the last two years, gold had been trading within the uh, 1700 to nearly $2,100 range. And that's true. It has. And it has broken down. This is a really good leading indicator of inflation. What caught my surprise yesterday was looking at where gold was in 2011. It was roughly this level. So you can say for, since 2011, more than 10 years, we haven't had a big burst, in, a b big breakout in the gold price. Uh, and, and that is informing our decision here. Gold is a leading indicator of inflation and it has not broken out. It is breaking down. And then the second thing that we're looking at is the uh, inventory glut around the world, uh, and especially in the United States, it looks like some of the best supply chain managed companies in the world uh, have over over ordered. They ignored their automated uh, enterprise resource planning system, so ERP systems, and double ordered, triple ordered, so that Nike, for example, its sales were up only three and a half percent globally uh, last quarter, and yet its inventories were up 44 uh, percent, and in the United States, they were up 68 percent, and if you look at it in transit, they're up 85 percent. So uh, that's just one indication. We're seeing lots of inventory overhangs. And Something to keep in mind, this is very important, is a lot of these companies had were way under inventory where they're at, at this time last year, so they might be comping against numbers that they're 
didn't have nearly the inventory they should have had in a normal environment, right? So now they maybe get in a normal inventory environment and now their inventories look like they're, they're flying high, right? In regards to Nike, I think, you know, they've tried to get a little greedy uh, in regards to Nike over the past several years, in, including, you know, some, uh, like, for instance, Foot Locker, right, which is a stock I own in my dividend-only account. Uh, Foot Locker is a company that has done tremendous helping Nike grow over the years, right? And giving them great placement in their stores and, and just, you know, phenomenal branding and all those sorts of things. And Nike tried to get a little greedy and try to go more in-house with selling and those sorts of things. And I think it's coming back to bite them a little bit. And I think they're going to have to relook at that and say, we're really making the right decision because some of these suppliers, like a Foot Locker, for example, have done a tremendous job growing our business, selling product, moving product, and if we're not as relevant in those, right, uh, maybe we become a little less relevant. And for Nike, their whole business is relevancy. Their whole business is brand and relevancy. And so, you know, with the Foot Locker thing, I just thought they got greedy. That was a, not a smart decision on their part. Foot Locker helps them get more relevancy and even, even a stronger brand because of how well they market in their stores. And uh, Nike just looked at that as, well, Foot Locker, we have to sell it for less money. We can make more margin if we sell it on our Nike website or something like that, right? Or in an actual Nike store. And it's like, Nike stores aren't a lot of places. There's very few Nike stores out there, you know, compared to obviously like a Foot Locker store or something like that, right? And not everybody wants to shop and, and buy a new pair of Nikes or Nike clothing or whatever on their website. So they just missed a tremendous, uh, you know, I think they just got greedy, man. Just got pure greed. And I think they're going to reevaluate things this coming year and realize, uh, you know, we need to uh, go a little bit back to our old ways because uh, this whole, well, let's try to maximize every amount of margin possible could actually end up to lower results for our overall business, which obviously shareholders don't like, which is why Nike going into, look at the year to date, you know, Nike down almost 50%. That's almost unheard of. Like Nike, come on, man. That's not one of those type of companies that you should see down 50%. That's insane. This isn't some, you know, whatever company. That's crazy. And even online sales are suffering. Uh, Amazon just had its uh, second prime day and it showed no increase, uh, which is really from a year, year over year, which is uh, telling us that either units are down or prices are down. They're horrible branding by Amazon. I didn't even know they had some prime day sale, extra sale going on thing. You know, like that was just Amazon missed the ball on that. Or maybe they didn't want to market it hard so they could just see like what organic uh, volumes would be or something like that. So I don't know. Uh, so I think the CPI that we got today is a lagging indicator. It always is a lagging indicator. And we're seeing a lot of prices in the pipeline that are falling. So Kathy, let's talk about what this means for the Fed in your open letter to the Fed, where you urge them to consider some of what you're talking about right now. Um, the market after today's data is now more fully pricing in not just a 75 basis point increase at this upcoming meeting, but at the one after that as well. Do you think the Fed should be done? Do you think they should even raise 75 basis points at this upcoming meeting? Or do you think they should stop here and give some time for their increases to make their way through the economy? Yes, as we're thinking about this question, we compare what Chairman Fa uh, Powell is doing to what Chairman Volcker did in the late 70s, early 80s, when he was fighting an inflation problem that had been building for 15 years. Vietnam War, Great Society, closing the gold window. That was a real inflation problem uh, that built up over 15 years. This inflation problem has been 12 to 15 months uh, by the time the Fed started addressing it. And we think it's much more a function of supply chain imbalances caused by COVID and then again by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These are very, very different circumstances. So what the Fed has done this time around is... He's 100% right. You know, if the whole Russia situation never happened, uh, to be quite frank... Uh, we wouldn't have felt this sort of level of inflation. Inflation was already an issue, but what what happened with Russia caused things to go so out of control. And you can see it, you know, right after the invasion. I mean, commodity prices went ridiculous, um, you know, for especially anything energy related. You know, it was it was out of control. So and um yeah, that's just, yeah, I mean, you look at, you know, the invasion happened and boom, you know, commodities went absolutely insane. And obviously that caused everything to get more expensive. You know, if you want to transport any product around, if fuel prices are much more expensive, 
you know, it raises inflation. That's just what happens. It has increased uh, interest rates. If they go another 75 basis points, which is very likely on November 2nd, they will have increased interest rates from 0.25 to 4%. And that's a 16 fold increase. What did Volcker in the early 80s? He took interest rates from 10 to 20%. That's a two fold increase after after consumers and businesses had gotten used to dealing with inflation and working around it over 15 years. Yeah. This is a, There's a great point buyer there. That's a 16 X, you know, in terms of how much they've raised the rate, you know, the economy is at a totally different state. The interest rates are at a totally different state, right. And have been for quite some time. So, you know, going 10 to 20% isn't nearly as big of a deal when your economy is already used to double digit uh, in interest rates. But when you talk about 16 Xing, uh, you know, fed funds rate, that's, that's quite intriguing. Real shock to the system. And I do believe we will see the ramifications in many ways. We're seeing housing shutting down. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of other activities shutting down as well. We believe we're in a recession and we believe this recession now will be sustained. Uh, and uh, if we see a, an increase in GDP, it's probably because either inventories are continuing to increase or imports are coming down as companies try to unwind their inventories. Kathy, so do you see a severe recession and then how long do you think this bear market will continue? So I agree with her. We are in recession right now. I, I kind of felt like that. It's obviously very, very mild, but I mean, you know, if you just look at everything, right? I thought about doing a whole video about this, but I'm likely not going to do it. Market down massively. Hmm. That usually happens in a recession, right? AIA investor sentiment. No one wants to buy any asset at all, right? Hmm. That's what happens in a recession. Um, if you look at any speculative asset, they've all been absolutely decimated. Hmm. That happens in a uh, recession, right? Housing drying up rapidly now at this point in time. Hmm. That happens in a recession. Consumer confidence, the lowest we've pretty much ever seen it in history. Hmm. That happens in a recession, right? GDP negative, two straight quarters. Hmm. That's usually what happens in a recession, right? So you throw those factors together and you get what is uh, a recession. The only thing you don't have is unemployment, right? But if unemployment's the only way you define a recession, I think it's a little misguided, to be quite frank, okay? So uh, earnings of a ton of companies fell dramatically, right? Hmm, that's what happens in a recession. Well, what's interesting, I think many people are coming around to the idea that we're in a recession or we're going into a recession. Uh, the first two quarters uh, with real GDP growth negative uh, to us means we're in a recession. And um, now that many people are worried uh, and are beginning to see recession for as far as the eye can see, we are looking at this recession a little bit differently. We think it's going to be uh, a function of this massive inventory overhang and that it's going to be a serious inventory correction, but it's not going to be anything like we saw in 08, 09. Uh, that was a systemic financial problem uh, caused by the mortgage and financial meltdown. We don't think this is the same, the same thing. So now that many economists are starting to agree with us that we're in a recession or going into a recession, we feel that they might become uh, a little bit too alarmist if this is just an inventory recession. Uh, and I think the Fed will have a lot to do with whether or not it is. This is a shock, though, to the system. And this idea that uh, we have an inventory overhang, we think it's going to get bigger as consumers pull back low saving rates, 3.5 percent versus 8 percent where it was before COVID. And, uh, and, and so we'll see. We think this holiday season is going to be pretty tough. And so as you kind of ready your shopping list. So basically list she's talking about a shallower recession, not as uh, super serious. And, 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 you know, the great financial crisis of 08, 09 really screwed up a lot of people's heads in terms of now everybody thinks every recession has to be this end of the world thing where the whole banking system really collapses, where home prices go down, you know, 30, 40, 50 plus percent where the stock market indexes go down 50 plus percent, right? And uh, that's just not the reality of what happens in most recessions. And uh, But because that happened in the last major recession, right, which a lot of people look at 2020 and they don't count that as a recession, even though that technically was a recession, they don't count that as one, right? Even though unemployment went to pretty much the highest numbers we've seen since the Great Depression. 
People don't count that one. So they look back, they say, oh, eight, oh, nine was this. So this has to be that. And it just doesn't have to be that at all. That's not the way uh, the financial markets work. That's not the way this whole thing works. Um, you know, you could get a more long drawn out, not as serious situation to happen there. Right. And, um, you know, I just think that's very important to to remember in regards to that. For that holiday season, Kathy, when you think about some of the kind of ways that equity valuations are starting to price in that recession to the best of their ability, is there a big buy that you now kind of think through or evaluate going into the, uh, the end of the year here? Well, you have to consider the source here. Uh, and uh, uh, our focus, our sole focus is on disruptive innovation. And we also believe that innovation solves problems. Uh, we had a tough time going into COVID with our kind of strategy. And then we had a boom in our strategy during COVID because guess what? Uh, we needed the genomic revolution uh, to help sequence the coronavirus and figure out tests and vaccines. And our kinds of companies helped with that. Uh, we think with supply chain issues, and with the food and energy prices caused by this shock, this Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that once again, innovation is going to help solve these problems. Electric vehicles, there's an accelerated consumer preference shift towards electric vehicles like Tesla uh, because of oil prices. And we think there's no stopping that trend now. And in terms of food prices, uh, we do believe that before I get to food prices, I mean, she brings up a great point for Tesla that I think is underappreciated in this market, right? I mean, I was seeing things about gas prices in some markets, um, you know, still, I think in California, like $6. I think I saw a sign that said $7 in California. I was like, wait, is that real? I'm going to have to fact check that because I was like, what, seven? This is like hard to even fathom, right? So everybody's gotten used to paying these, you know, very ridiculous gas prices, right? And you know, even here in Vegas, like, you know, uh, even though I don't drive, uh, obviously gas cars, right. I got the S and I got the X and those are electrics, but I still like see the signs and like a lot of the signs are still like five bucks a gallon or high fours. And I'm like, how's that even possible with the, the fact that oils come down so much, but nonetheless, when, when consumers are seeing this, believe me, people are thinking, Hmm, that next vehicle might be an EV. Cause I'm getting sick of spending several hundred dollars a month on just fuel prices, right? I mean, everybody's pretty much paying anywhere between 50% and up to 125%, depending upon what state you live in, more expensive prices than you were paying a year ago, right? And especially for the, and this has lasted for like six plus months now at this point in time. So everybody's gonna consider an EV for their next vehicle, I can promise you that, um, especially when they go to buy a new vehicle. And if you're considering EV, it starts with Tesla and it ends with Tesla and then everything else is in between, right? And so that's obviously a very bullish thing for Tesla that uh, kind of supercharges likely growth over 2023, 2024, and 2025 that wasn't planned, right? I mean, even a lot of us Tesla bulls, I, I never planned like oil prices were going to go insane and gas prices are going to go insane. Uh, so this is just kind of like an extra bullish uh, thing for Tesla now at this point in time. In editing is going to help us figure out how to produce crops in areas that are less fertile than the Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe, with less uh, water, uh, less fertilizer, less pesticide. Uh, so we're going to see, continue to see the miracles associated with the genomic revolution. Uh, but our other strategies as well, whether we're talking about uh, robotics, solving the labor shortage, uh, energy storage, I mentioned electric vehicles uh, pulling us away from oil consumption, uh, artificial intelligence, which is going to help every company become more competitive if they use their data um, in and, and combine. She's in a hotel room. You can tell because it's got that little sign there that hotel rooms have to have by law. I was trying to figure out if this is a Wynn hotel room. It almost kind of looks like uh, the rooms at the Wynn a little bit, but I see white back there. I don't know with other data in effective ways, and then blockchain technologies, which is going to take the middlemen out of a lot of businesses uh, and take the cost out of a lot of businesses, uh, helping us to solve this inflation problem. So uh, again, consider the source. Uh, we think innovation solves problems. It certainly uh, gave us uh, an appreciation of that during COVID. Our strategy uh, was high flying. And we think we have even more problems right now. So um, stay tuned. 
Kathy, this economic shock that you you talk about in large part at the hands of the Fed, does that cause a shock to one of your long term holdings in Tesla in terms of the stock price and also the company's financials? Well, certainly all stocks are are experiencing difficulty in this environment as as the market tries to understand how far the Fed is going to go and and how deep this uh, recession is going to be. Uh, so Tesla, as I mentioned, is a, a solution to the problem. It's very interesting. If you look at gasoline demand this summer uh, in the United States, it dropped below COVID levels, the worst of COVID, and wow. it dropped to levels that we have not seen since 1997. Wow. That's real demand destruction. And it couldn't have happened, we do not believe, wow. without electric vehicles at the margin uh, taking huge share from traditional automobiles. So if we had to be concerned about uh, a, 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 an industry, it would be the traditional auto industry. We think that gas powered vehicles are, um, are, are, are going to be obsolete within the next five to 10 years. And the traditional auto industry has to figure out a way to migrate into electric vehicles and into the next big phase, which we think uh, Tesla is leading, uh, the autonomous taxi platform phase. So lots of changes here. Traditional industries are in harm's way as innovation uh, pushes through, accelerated by some of the turmoil out there. Yeah, I like that. You know, and I, uh, I used to talk about this, you know, when obviously I was buying Tesla stock back in like 2018, 2019. I used to talk about like, imagine the year 2028 or the year 2030 or whatever, uh, going to a uh, car dealership and being like, I want to buy a new internal combustion vehicle, right? Uh, it just doesn't even seem like a plausible thing, you know, in my mind, at least back then and still this day, I think it's a lot more realistic. Uh, I think a lot of people thought I was crazy back then for saying things like that. I think a lot of people are kind of like starting to get it now and like, yeah, you know, used used uh, ICE vehicles will still be obviously bought and sold, you know, uh, five, ten years in the future. But five, ten years in the future, are people still going to buy new internal combustion engine vehicles? Um, I think it's fairly unrealistic, especially in the United States of America and especially especially if you're talking about uh, a period where energy prices are elevated over the coming years, which there's definitely a lot of folks on Wall Street that believe, uh, you know, we're kind of in a super cycle for commodities for years, and that we'll see if that plays out, right? Uh, but there's a lot of them that are big believers in the price of oil over the coming years, right? And if that's the situation, I mean, if that's really the situation there, right, uh, that just gives more fuel to the fire in terms of uh, people considering EVs and wanting to get EVs. Kathy, when we last talked back in the spring, I believe it was just at the beginning of the Elon Musk Twitter saga. Now we are maybe, maybe getting to um, a little bit of closure in that case. Um, but I would pose to you the same question that I asked you then, because a lot of time has elapsed and different events have happened. Are you at all concerned about Musk's attention wavering now that it looks like he is, in fact, going to be taking over and likely at least having a pretty heavy hand in running Twitter? Well, um, we are prolific users of Twitter. Our uh, gives away its research. We give away our research, not when it's finished, but as it's evolving. And our most prolific platform, social platform out there, is Twitter. Um, I'm kind of excited to see what Elon will do. I, I actually think he'll work closely with Jack Dorsey and maybe open up the ecosystem, take away the censorship, uh, make it much more transparent, and I think add more value to that ecosystem. You don't think that, that it'll be a mess if that happens? That it'll just be sort of a free-for-all where it's tougher to find commentary of value? You know what's interesting about Twitter, and we found this, uh, we, we have a lot of debate around ARC's own strategies, um, we can filter that debate ourselves. So we can unfollow people if we think there's bad behavior, but that's our choice. And we can follow those people who we think are moving discussions, whether it's about innovation 
or the economy moving uh, moving discussions along. So I think um, I think there's a lot of wisdom out there, and uh, we're kind of sick of the nonsense that uh, that that we see on some of these social platforms. And Twitter, I think, is going to give us more tools uh, to filter out the nonsense and get right down to business. I certainly would like to filter out a lot of the nonsense sometimes on there, Kathy. Um, I want to ask you more broadly about ARK Invest and your funds. I was looking at um, ARK K in particular and the fund flows that we have seen, um, which were seeing sort of bigger swings to the up and to the downside earlier in the year. They've gotten a little more muted as of late. You talk a lot about your three to five year time horizon, which yes. I think makes sense. But I wonder how long, how patient investors are going to be, particularly in an environment where they are seeing losses, not just in RK, but in lots of other areas as well. Yes. And I think um, one thing that helps our uh, clients is, is our research. And they see that it's first principles research. It, we have the long-term time horizon and we're seeing spectacular exponential growth opportunities. And not only one by one, the various platforms I just described, but the convergence of those platforms. So one S curve feeding another. And I think many of our clients understand that they're short. Once we're done this, I'm gonna actually pull up her top positions and uh, I'm gonna go through some of those stocks and give my personal opinion on uh, those stocks. And you know, if I think they're true great growth companies for the long term, or if I think they're um, not quite that. Innovation, truly disruptive innovation. If you own the NASDAQ or the NASDAQ, 100 right now, and you look through that index, this is not the index that I grew up with. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, when we were looking for innovation, we'd go to the NASDAQ. But if you look through the NASDAQ now, and especially the NASDAQ 100, what you see are 25% uh, of the names touching disruptive innovation. The rest of them are kind of me too. They look like other indexes, the FANGs, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Tesla would be our only overlap. And then you look further and, and more deeply into these indices and you see names that you'd never expect to be there. Food and beverage, uh, utilities, rails, brick and mortar retail. These are not innovation companies. And so what we've done at ARC is- She's the only one I really heard talk about that and I really appreciate that and it's the truth. You know, go through the NASDAQ and you'll find exactly what you just said there. Pure play innovation. And we'd like to think we are what the NASDAQ used to be mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s. And it used to be a very productive place to invest with a long term investment time horizon. So I think our sharing our research and our pointing out to investors, look, what you think you own in innovation is not what it used to be. And what ARC is doing is really back to the future. Uh, we're all about investing in the future as opposed to indexes, which are more about past success. Those companies that have been extremely successful have risen to the top of these indexes. But if we're right in these five platforms that involve 14 different technologies are going to disrupt the traditional world order, then uh, investors need to get to the right side of change. And one of the other things that we do, it's one of our missions and, and values, is to educate. That's why we give our research away. And we want to educate not only investors, but parents and grandparents uh, about how the world is changing, how radically it's changing, and how it's ever more important to get, st especially students, on the right side of change so that they can enjoy these incredible growth opportunities and not be disrupted by industries that will be um, sunsetting, shall I say. I appreciate Kathy, that. Kathy, a three to five year time horizon means not only kind of midterm or recession proofing your companies, you're not just recession proofing your portfolio, you're also kind of midterm proofing your portfolio, you're general election proofing your portfolio. And so, you know, at ARC, how do you go about identifying disruptive innovation that then doesn't get disrupted by public policy or political agenda? Well, one, we have a, a, a six metric scoring system, very much focused on innovation. One of the scores is thesis risk. 
thesis risk uh, has a lot to do with government policy. And so in the in the early days of ARC in 2014-15, we were uh, thinking, okay, government may be very concerned about the safety of autonomous vehicles. But as we've um, moved uh, through these last eight years, uh, what we've seen thankfully, is the government and regulators in particular very focused on data. And what does the data say? The data says that uh, that uh, most fatalities and accidents, 85, almost 90 percent of them, are caused by human error. If we take the human being out of the equation, then we're going to save up to 35, 40,000 lives in the United States, the, the fatalities per year, and up to 1.25 million around the world. Uh, huge numbers. And, you know, in, re- in regards to that uh, subject, right, one part of that component is just like the human part, right, saving lives, which is massive. And uh, it's going to be beautiful once we can off- hopefully over the next decade or so get to a point where, you know, it becomes a freak situation for somebody to die in a car accident, right? Similar to like, you know, a plane crash or something like that. Like that's a freak situation that everybody would be like, what? That actually happened? Uh, nowadays, you know, people are just dying all the time on the roads and, and no one even pays attention or cares because it's so common, right? So it's going to be beautiful when we get to a day where that becomes like a freak situation. And um, human drivers aren't going to magically get <laughs> massively better. It just doesn't work like that. So that's going to be nice. And then also from the economic side, right? Think about all the people's lives that are extremely negatively disrupted, right? You know, if somebody dies in a car accident and what that does uh, to a family and the financial hardship that puts them in, right? And it just causes so many bad things. So I think that's something that's just underestimated and understated out there. And I appreciate Kathy Wood bringing that up because I think it is very important, very important subject. So that is a, a noble goal. And we've been very gratified to see the regulators looking at the fatalities in Tesla's vehicles and informing us that for, for the most part, most of those fatalities were caused by human error. And, uh, and for the second, that uh, people who are driving Tesla vehicles are much safer thanks to the, the various automated driving um, capabilities now, uh, up to 40% safer than in most other cars. So we're, we're very focused on what government, uh, what governments are studying in terms of the data. And if they stick to the data, innovation typically, um, it, it solves problems. All right, good, good stuff by Kathy Wood. I wanna go through some, a few of her biggest stocks here and kind of give my two cents. All right, so now we're on kathywoodstocks.com, which tracks on a daily basis uh, Kathy Wood's uh, top positions, essentially, all right? And so her top position right now in the ARC fund, the main ARC fund, is Zoom stock. I uh, don't really agree with that one. I think Zoom's okay. Um, I don't think they're going out of business or anything like that by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I, I do think there's a lot, a lot better stocks out there than in Zoom, in my personal opinion. If you're trying to bet on innovation, uh, Zoom's you know, got one really good thing um, that's they've had for years, and they've had trouble expanding that. Tesla, phenomenal, obviously. Roku, not super excited about that one. I think she could be in Fubo and get way more innovation there and uh, way more growth than uh, Roku over the coming years. And Telethera- I don't want to speak about therapeutics company, Exact Sciences, CRISPR Therapeutics. I don't want to speak about those three. Those aren't really my circle of competence. Coinbase, uh, I, I agree with Coinbase. Uh, obviously, innovative company. Continue, I think of fintech, it's one of the most innovative companies you can find out there. So I like Coinbase. Uh, I don't want to, uh, to comment on Path there. Square, definitely, uh, I like that one. I don't personally own it, but I like it. Cash app, uh, almost always the number one most popular finance app in the uh, United States of America, usually followed by Venmo and PayPal. So I like that one. Beam Therapeutics, don't really want to speak on that one. Shopify, I think she should make Shopify a much bigger position. I think she should be adding Shopify aggressively, um, basically over the, the coming months, honestly. I think I think there's a few other stocks out there that I could see her adding. I think Meta, I, I think you know the fact that she doesn't own a substantial stake, I, Meta should be a top 10 position for them, in my personal opinion. You know, the metaverse opportunity, if they're going to miss out on that, they don't understand they're, they're missing out on the biggest thing um, 
you know, to happen to the economy in, in, you know, since a smartphone essentially. So I really think they should be adding that. Uh, when, uh, you know, I think they should add Palantir back. I think they made a mistake by getting out of that one and saying bye bye. I think they should get back in Palantir in a substantial way. Meta, I think they should get in a substantial way. Fubo, I think they should get in a substantial way. Um, some of these other stocks, no, no, I mean, they could get in PayPal, but they probably won't because they already own Square. So I kind of understand that. Um, as far as these other stocks here, don't really see it. They should get in the chef in all seriousness. They should need to add some plant-based food company there that they won't do that, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of a, my opinion there on a few stocks they should add big positions of. As far as other big techs out there, you know, Uber is not really an innovation play. Uh, I think it is going to become a cash flow play and a net income play over the coming years, but it's not really an innovation play per se anymore. Um, they've just completely kind of changed their trajectory there. Adobe, I think, could be interesting for them. And I honestly do think they should probably build out a big position in AMD, in my personal opinion, over the next, uh, let's, and I, I'm pretty sure they already own NVIDIA, but I think they should build a substantial position in an AMD over the next uh, 6 to 12 months, to be honest. Yeah, they have AMD as their 23rd biggest position. Uh, but AMD, with them owning Xilinx now, too, I think they should build that into a big position. And uh, so that's just my personal opinion. I don't run the money for ARC. Uh, but Kathy, if you're watching this and you need somebody to run the money when you're ready to step down, okay, I got you. Okay, I got you. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I appreciate you joining me as always. Much love. Thanks for everybody for being here. 16,000 plus subscribers now at this point in time. If you want my free stock picking checklist, check out the pinned comment down there. Thank you for watching and have a great day.